Hello and welcome to today's Library Adventures Live. My name's Olivia and I'm one of the librarians with Kirklees. Now today we are joined with the fantastic author, Connie Huck. She's going to be here to talk about her book. It's the latest one in the Cookie series, Cookie and the Most Mysterious Mystery in the World. Now, some of the grown-ups especially will remember Connie from her days on Blue Peter. She's actually the longest serving Blue Peter presenter from 1997 to 2008. And since then, she's gone on to do other work in television, on radio, screenwriting, and thankfully for us now, we're very excited that she's an author and illustrator. So for her session today, you are going to need some paper and a pencil. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to pop off now and get those if you haven't done already. And if you've got any questions for Connie, you can type those in the live chat on Facebook and YouTube. Now, before we meet Connie, I just want to cast your minds back to a couple of weeks ago when we had the wonderful author, Ross Montgomery. Ross was here to talk about his book, The Chime Seekers, which was all about Yanni. Now, Yanni's baby sister got taken away by the evil fairies and replaced with a changeling, which is a fairy baby. So this, The Chime Seekers is all about Yanni's journey into the fairy realm to try and find his sister. And he has to do this with the evil changeling on his back. So it's quite an exciting story, quite dark. And he set you a challenge, which I hope some of you are going to have time to complete. He wanted you to draw a room that you know really well. So a bedroom or maybe your classroom at school and then turn it evil. So maybe the chair might snap you up when you sit on it. Maybe the table has teeth, possibly your drinking straw or your pencil. Maybe it turns into a poisonous porcupine quill. Anything like that, and he wanted you to draw and scribble all over the picture with all your ideas. And then if you can send them to us at lal at kirklees.gov.uk, because we've had some fantastic ones and we'd love to see some more. And if you'd like to turn them into stories as well, even better. Right, I think it's time we bring Connie on now. Remember, you can type questions for her in the chat. And if you'd like to see, if you're watching this session, um, Sorry, I should say, if you wanted to see Ross's session or any of the previous ones, you can always catch up on www.kirkleyslibraries.co.uk forward slash lal. That might be where you're watching Connie's session today. Right, let's bring her in. Morning, Connie. Hello. Hi, Olivia. Hello, everyone. Hi, it's nice to see you. Now, I can see you've got lots of books. Are you going to be telling us a little bit about the other cookie books as well? Yes, so uh, these are the three books in the cookie series and I'm going to be talking you through the whole series because this is book number three, but they all work as standalone books as well. Um, but they all are themed around a different subject, which is a little bit sort of science because cookies quite into science. Excellent. Well, I'm going to leave you to it, Connie, and people hopefully will be sending questions in and we've got some that have already been sent in. So I'll Fact. pop back at the end and we'll have a little bit of a Q&A. &A. Okie dokie. See you later, Olivia. See you later. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. I'm Connie Huck and I'm an author, as was mentioned by Olivia just now. And these are the books in the Cookie series, which I'm going to talk you through today. There you go, you can see them. Now let me tell you a little bit about Cookie. Cookie is over here and she is a fun loving nine-year-old at the beginning of the series. There we can see her and you can see there's a cat behind her in this picture and in book one Cookie really really wants a pet. Um, her best friend is moving away from town and she's really upset and she feels that a pet might perhaps fill the void. This book is called Cookie and the Most Annoying boy in the world and you can guess who moves into town someone that cookie thinks is the most annoying boy in the world you can kind of see him on the cover under this splash here um but annoying is something that we call subjective which means it's in the eye of the beholder it's your opinion so someone might think one thing is annoying but someone else might think that very same thing is brilliant and we're allowed to change our minds at any time so you have to read the book to find out whether jake who's this chap over here does turn out to be the most annoying boy in the world after all or has cookie got it wrong that's the big question will her best friend end up moving away will cookie get the pet what will happen you'll have to read the book to find out but this book is what we call 
the uh, first in the series. And it is an overview of Cookie's world. So you get to meet all the characters in the Cookie series. And I thought it might be fun if we have a little bit of a draw along. And um, you'll see that in the book, there's loads and loads of little sort of cartoony comic strip pictures of Cookie in the gang. That's her best friend there. Kazai that you can see, that's Jake, who you can see as well. And they're all drawn in a very similar way, but with different hair. There we see Axel has different hair. And then also you can change their clothes as well. So Susie and Alison then be over here, um, are wearing skirts as their school uniform, unlike Cookie and the rest of the gang. Now, if you had said to me when I was your age that I would be an author and I would be illustrating my own books that would be in the shops, I would say, don't be crazy, I can't do that. I can't draw and I'm no good at writing stories. And anybody watching now who thinks that, you are wrong. You all have the capability of both writing your own books and illustrating them as well. And I can tell you something, by the end of this session, you probably might be able to draw a cookie better than I can. Because as I mentioned before, in the books, this is as good as the pictures get. These little comic strip pictures with little speech bubbles um, where you can see all the funny thoughts that are going on inside Cookie's head. So hopefully you've got a pen and a paper handy. And if not, uh, you've got time to quickly whiz and get one. If you're watching this not live, you can press pause and go and grab one. Um, and I'm going to show you exactly how to draw Cookie and the gang. So first of all, it's really easy. All you need to do for all of the characters is just draw a circle like that. And you can see my circle's not perfect. It's a little bit wonky, but that adds to the charm. Um, and then we're gonna draw a smile because I think Cookie's happy today. And two eyes. Now, as you can see, the eyes are just lines that go down and the smile is just literally like a sort of shallow U shape. So then next, Cookie's body, is just essentially a rectangle. There we are. And then her legs are two chunkier rectangles. And their school uniform is often um, depicted with black trousers. So I'm just going to colour it in. But you don't have to. You could have cookie and white trousers. Then two lines for the feet. There we go. And then we can draw in the arms. Now, the great thing about the arms is they can be doing whatever we want them to. So you could maybe have Cookie waving. There we go. So put a bend in the middle of the arm. Or maybe she's got her hand on her hip like that. There we go. And it's just simply done with lines. So this is how all of the characters start life. They pretty much are all like this to begin with. And then we just change who they are by changing the hair. So Cookie just has lines coming out the top of her head on each side. And once again, it doesn't matter if they're wonky because Cookie's hair is often disheveled. And then there we go. That is as good as the pictures of Cookie get in the book. You can probably draw them as well or even better. And like I said, they all start life in a similar fashion. So these are the eyes. And that's the head shape. There we go. And you can um, vary the mouth. If you want to make someone sad, you do that, obviously. If you uh, want to uh, make someone uh, surprised, how about that? With high eyebrows. Um, and then if you want to make someone, um, you know, uh, maybe a bit worried, how about that? Eyebrows at the side and a wiggly mouth. You can try different expressions. So remember, it's all in the hair. So Jake's hair flicks off to the side like that. So that's how Jake looks. Uh, Axel, who is another character, he has a little spiky, standy uppy hair like that. And then Kaziah has curly hair. That's Cookie's best friend with two little buns at the side like that. So there we go. You can have a go at drawing all the different characters. And like I say, you can vary their clothes as well. So Susie Ashby, whose hair starts off a bit like Jade's, but then she has bunches. She has often been known to be wearing a skirt. So there we are. That's a skirt um, 
Now, once you've mastered that, you can start making little comic strip pictures. And um, the way to do a speech bubble is just with the stalk and a bubble like that. Hi. If you want someone to be shouting, you can even do a zigzaggy speech bubble. If they're shouting really loud, the bubble can be zigzaggy as well as the stalk. And you can even do capitals. Hi! Exclamation mark. There we go. And that makes it a bit louder. There we go. And the circle mouth shows that they're shouting. So you can have lots and lots of fun drawing Cookie and the gang in their adventures in a comic strip. Now you could even draw yourself and your friends into the comic strip. And all you have to do is just remember the secret of the fact that the head is always more or less the same. Maybe if your friend or you have a thinner face, you can draw a thinner circle or a wider circle if they've got a wider face um, and then draw whatever hairstyle your friend or whoever you're writing into it has. So if I was going to put myself into this comic strip, I'd look at my hair and see that it parts to the side. I've got a bit of a sweep going on. So I'll start a parting at the side and go down in this sort of sweepy way. It goes towards my eyes and then it comes round and it goes to sort of shoulder length essentially so there we go and then a bit lower actually than my shoulder so you have to you might need to look in the mirror to master your own hair and then on this side as well there we go and then i'm wearing a hood top today so i could draw a, a hood there we are and uh it's got a zip so there we go and there you can see I've drawn me into the mix. And you could draw your friends, you could draw your teachers, whoever you wanted, and just make a really cool comic strip story. There we go, I'm wearing tighter tapered trousers today. So like that, I've drawn me into the comic strip. And um, you can have real fun playing with the expressions. Like I said, eyebrows are really handy. So I could make up a whole new person. There we are, with curly hair like that. And then if they're angry, you could do downturned eyebrows like that. There we go. And downturned eyebrows show anger. There we go. And a downturned mouth. Um, so you can have real fun playing around with people, haircuts and expressions and make some brilliant comic strips. There we go. Someone there with little small eyes. Really play around and have a go at creating your own comic strips at home. Now, um... Cookie is very into, so she loves art and she loves drawing and she's very creative. Chaos follows her around. She often gets into scrapes and situations like on the cover here where things have gone wrong in the experiment she's doing. She's really into science and um, she thinks very crazy thoughts. Her mind has flights of fancy, which are all in the comic strip pictures in the books and um she also really really loves science it's her favorite subject at the beginning of the cookie book um there's an about me section and it has questions that you often get in the beginning of a journal stuff like name parents hobbies age pets star sign best friend um favorite teacher it asks for favorite subject and for favourite subject, Cookie says, science. How can anybody not love science? I like it because it explains everything. And that's very true. The reason that I'm talking to you now via a screen is thanks to science. The reason that you're in a building right now and the ceiling hasn't fallen on your head and squashed you is thanks to science. Engineers have been able to use science and mathematics to calculate the stresses and strains to keep the building standing up. Many of you will have traveled in a car and it didn't crash because the brakes stop it when you press the brakes. And that's thanks to science. You've had medicines that help you get better. And it's all thanks to science. It's thanks to science that human beings can build buildings that don't fall down, design cars and planes that don't crash and make medicines to help us get better. Without progress in science, we'd all still be cavemen running around in rabbit skins with sticks, no houses, no TVs, no iPads. We owe science a lot. And there you can see a picture of Kaziah and Cookie and how they'd look as cave people. But it's thanks to science that we're not all cave people. Cookie likes long words, by the way. And here's a good word that she likes, troglodyte, which is the word for someone that lives in a cave. 
But anyway, like I said, thanks to science, we don't all live in caves right now. Um, and I thought what might be fun is if we tried a few experiments right now, at the front of the book, you can see that there's a science experiment that Cookie does at school and it goes very wrong. Lots of you might know this experiment. It's what happens when you add a certain mint into a fizzy drink and you get an explosion. Now, I don't think it would be wise to do that today because I'd get into a real mess. But the experiments we're going to do are things that you can all try at home with things that are hanging around your house. Um, so feel free to have a go at these when you get home. But please make sure you ask for permission from a parent or guardian, whoever's looking after you. And some of these can get a little bit messy. So um, maybe it's wise to do it over a sink or in a bathroom because I don't want you to be getting your bed soaking wet or, or your mum's sofa or her favourite rug. Um, okay, so the first experiment we're going to do just requires to kick off with a glass. This is just an ordinary drinking glass and some water. Now to prove that this isn't anything fancy, it's not hydrochloric acid or anything like that. It's just water that comes out of the tap. I'm just going to have a sip. Just kidding. It's fine. It is regular water. So all you need to kick this experiment off with is a glass of water like that. And then get a piece of paper or card. And then we're going to draw something asymmetric on it. Now, if you don't know what asymmetric is, I'm going to explain to you. So I'm going to just draw an arrow. But you can draw whatever you want. So I'm doing a nice chunky arrow. Now, asymmetric means something is the same on both sides. So if you stuck a mirror down the middle, the mirror image would restore the picture again. So this is asymmetric. If I took half of it and then put a mirror over here, it would restore the picture to the same half because on both sides it sticks out at the top and then goes thin at the bottom. But if I did this and then put a mirror down the middle, it wouldn't be asymmetric anymore. Uh, one half, if I put a mirror over it, would give us a diamond if we restored the image. And then the other half would give us a line, essentially. So that's asymmetric. And that is symmetric. So on your paper, we're going to draw an asymmetric image. And then what you're going to do is get your glass of water and then pop your image behind the glass. Now, can you see which way the arrow is pointing? Can you see which way it's pointing? Now, let's put it behind the glass and see what happens. What happens when I put it behind the glass? <gasps> the arrow changes direction. How does that happen? That is the magic of science. All of you can try it at home. There's no tricks. The arrow points in the opposite direction. If it's a symmetric image, as you can see, there will be no change whatsoever. The arrow is still pointing up, but if it is asymmetric, the arrow changes direction. You can all try that at home and you can do it with anything. So I've written cookie here. And then if I put it behind the glass, it's changing direction. Now, um, and the reason that works is due to something called refraction, which is where light bends its direction of travel when it enters a different medium. So that's what happens when the light enters the glass of water. And due to the shape of the glass, the light is bent in such a way that when it reaches my eye, the whole image has reversed. It is so clever and it's all thanks to science. There's no magic involved. Now for the next experiment, you also need a glass of water and you need a bit of cardboard. This is just ordinary corrugated cardboard that came off a packing box. And then what I'm going to do, I might put a tray down in case this gets a little bit messy. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill the glass up to the very top with my water. Here we go. There we are. And then I'm going to get my cardboard and I'm going to pop it on top. Now this cardboard, as you can see, it's got no glue on it. There's no tricks. It's just ordinary cardboard gonna pop it on top of my glass of water 
and I'm going to turn the whole thing upside down and I'm going to let go and let's see what happens, shall we? <gasps> Can you see? It's stuck. There's no glue. There's nothing, no trickery, nothing stopping it or keeping it up there or stopping it falling. Now, that, again, is due to science. The air pressure all in this room, all the air is exerting pressure upwards on the cardboard, which is greater than the pressure of the water pushing down on the cardboard. And so it means that the pressure pushes the cardboard up um, because it's much, much more than the pressure pushing down. And so it stays in place, that cardboard. How clever is that? If I had more headroom, I'd be able to stick it over my head and show that I wouldn't get wet. Um, but alas, I don't. So there you go. That's experiment number two. So easy. All you need is a glass of water and some cardboard. And you can all try that at home. But you have to make sure the cardboard is not kinked in any way, otherwise it won't work. If any air can get under that cardboard and into that glass, then the experiment won't work anymore, which is why you have to do it over a sink, because it can go wrong that one. You need a really good flat piece of cardboard and you need to make sure the water is right to the top of your glass. Now, the third experiment also involves water, and it is water that's inside a Ziploc bag. There's no goldfish here. I haven't been to the fair. It's literally just a Ziploc bag of water. And I'm now going to get a wooden skewer and I am going to poke it through the bag. Now you would expect the water to gush out, but if you look, it's not gushing out. And once again, that's due to the magic of science. Um, the reason this happens is to do with a property of the plastic that the bag is made from, um, which I'm going to explain to you. And we're going to cover plastic as well when we look at book two. There we go. Uh, so that's another one that you can feel free to try out at home. So I will put that away and explain to you the science. So the plastic is made up of long hydrocarbon chains, molecules in long chains. So you might have often heard of plastics like polyvinyl chloride or polythene, and poly means lots, and there's lots of these chains. And they give the plastic its properties. Often plastic can be stretchy in those bags and quite malleable. And when you stick your skewer through the bag, it's essentially skewering in between those long hydrocarbon chains and that is why the water doesn't come out the back almost seals up around your skewer so there we go none of those were magic they were just all scientific ex experiments that you can try at home now it's those properties of plastic that mean plastic can be hard to dispose of and get rid of, which is no good for our environment. Which brings me on nicely to book two. So book one was Cookie and the most annoying boy in the world. And we're talking about Jake, the new kid who moves into town. And book two, if we can see it again, is Cookie and the most annoying girl in the world. So Cookie is no longer annoyed with Jake by now. She's actually quite good friends with Jake. Um, but the whole class are really into being eco-warriors. They're into saving the planet and climate change. I'm sure loads and loads of you, there we go, you can see Susie with her Save the Planet sign there, are also into this. But Susie doesn't quite grasp the concept. If we look at that picture, you can see Susie's holding a Save the Planet um, a no to plastic sign rather, and it's made of plastic. She's wearing a Save the Planet t-shirt and it's made of nylon. As with those plastic bags that I use in the experiment, um, that means that there's hydrocarbon chains in there and it's the carbon content of plastic that makes it not good for our planet, as I will explain to you in just a moment. So in this book, Cookie decides, that she is going to have a Save the Planet birthday party. Now, loads of you will have had or been to themed birthday parties before. Um, you might have been to a unicorn party or a Save, uh, not Save the Planet party, a unicorn party or maybe a superhero party. But unfortunately, Cookie's birthday party has to get cancelled because she has to go and visit her relatives. Then Susie steals her idea 
and has a Save the Planet party. But as I explained to you before, Susie doesn't quite grasp the concept. So look, you can see all the things at her party. There's plastic bunting, plastic cups, plastic plates, forks, spoons, knives. There's a flag there, balloons, which are non-biodegradable, which we're going to come on to in a minute. And so this party is not saving any planet. And Cookie gets really annoyed because her two best friends go to Susie's party. And so Cookie gets a little bit jealous. Anyway, she ends up kind of becoming friends with Susie Ashby. Uh, but it does really start to annoy her that Susie just doesn't get what saves the planet entails, as we can see in this picture here. So um, I think actually it is quite a complicated thing. We hear so much stuff about single use plastic and not driving and petrol and the polar ice caps melting and species dying out, but it's quite a big thing to get your head around saving the planet. So if we have a look at this diagram here, I can explain to you exactly what it's all about. So for millions and millions of years, humans and animals lived in perfect harmony with plants and greenery and trees. Plants and greenery and trees give out oxygen, which we breathe in. So did you know the more greenery there is, the better the quality of the air we breathe. The more trees and plants, the more oxygen. And oxygen is what we need to live and breathe healthily. So when we breathe in the oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. And plants and trees and greenery use that carbon dioxide to grow and make food, food that we eat, um, and they give out oxygen. So the cycle is continuous. We take in the oxygen, we give out the carbon dioxide. The plants take in the carbon dioxide, they give out the oxygen. We eat the plants and we grow. And anything that we um, poo out uh, essentially can go back into the earth. So when a cow does a cow poo, the poo goes on the mud, it goes into the earth again, and the plants can grow, taking the nutrients from that poo. It's a cycle that is ongoing. It's the cycle of life. And for many, many years, the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide was perfect for this cycle to continue. But then, not that long ago, us human beings decided to uh, start mining fossil fuels. So that's natural oil and coal. And when we extract that stuff out of the earth, carbon that is captured in the earth has now come out of the earth. And we do this by a process called fractional distillation um, and also through coal mining as well. Now through fractional distillation, you can make loads and loads of different things. You can make oil and you can make petrol for cars to use and you can make plastics like say the plastic on these scissors here but the thing about these man-made substances they're not naturally occurring like the wood in this ruler that is wood from a tree or the uh, cotton in this top which is naturally occurring or wool in your jumper that comes from a sheep or metal that's a naturally occurring substance essentially anything naturally occurring can break down so if i bury this metal in the ground it will rust and break down and all the nutrients will go back in the earth if i bury this ruler in the ground this ruler will rot and break down and the nutrients will go back in the earth bury some plastic in the ground that won't happen the best thing that might happen is it might break down a little bit but even then there's microbeads which are really bad for the plant life and the ecology and the environment we live in if i try and burn this plastic that will cause fumes that have carbon in and that carbon will increase the carbon gas in the air and it spoils the balance that I showed you before, the balance between oxygen and carbon that lets plants and animals live in harmony. So suddenly we've got an excess amount of carbon. There's too much carbon and we can't get rid of it. And it's really, really bad because the more carbon we have in our atmosphere, the warmer our planet gets. Uh, and that leads to things like the ice caps melting and different plant and animal species dying out. And so it's good to say no to plastic and yes to natural materials. So this ruler, for instance, uh, is from when my parents 
uh, bought it from WH Smith. It's got the old WH Smith logo from probably the 1960s or something. But you know, it's lasted all this time. And the more we can use things for a long time and make them last, the more we are saving our planet. Even if something is plastic, as long as you're not throwing it away, but you're using it and you're making it last as long as possible, then that is better than everything being disposable because we can't get rid of plastic. So there are a few things that we can do. Here are some tips. We can look after our oceans. Our oceans give us 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. Our oceans sustain a lot of plant and wildlife and they're really important. Lots of the plastic that we throw away ends up in the ocean. That could be harmful to sea creatures and living things in our ocean. You know, you hear a lot about recyclable plastics, but very little of it actually gets recycled. We can also make sure that we eat sustainable fish. So any fish we eat, any animals that, or anything we take out from the earth, we need to make sure we can replace it because we don't want things becoming extinct and dying out. Number two, we need to look after our forests and our greenery. Um, it's really important once again for oxygen. And once greenery is lost often it isn't replaced you know you build cities and you build factories and so on and so forth and our air quality gets worse the more greenery you get rid of so we need to look out after our forests number three use as little plastic as possible go for wood or go for metal make sure your parents take a bag for life to the supermarket when they go shopping as opposed to a plastic bag because like i say plastic hangs around forever and um, and fossil fuels like petrol in cars and stuff that's just as harmful because it also has carbon emissions and number four sustainable living so that's what i was saying anything we take out of the earth needs to be able to be returned in the earth so you need to use things for as long as possible and use things made out of natural substances so here are some top tips for things that we can do if we eat less meat that's a really good thing fruit and veg are healthier and meat is reared on land that has been cleared of its greenery um to rear livestock, we don't need to eat as much meat as us human beings eat. And it's upping the carbon to have more people and more animals on Earth also ups the uh, the carbon that um, is out there because humans also have carbon content, did you know? Um, so, you know, the best thing to do is eat as much fruit and veg as possible. We don't want to clear all of that land and all of that greenery just so that we can have a few more burgers no thanks turn stuff off it's really important not to waste things so don't keep taps running when you're brushing your teeth maybe take showers instead of bath um keep lights off if you're not in those rooms that uh have the lights on it's really important to conserve everything and not waste stuff um, use less plastic. As I said, natural materials are much better because we can dispose of them responsibly, whereas plastic, to get rid of it, ups the carbon gas in the air and our carbon footprint. Also, as well as that, we can walk and bike to places because it's much healthier for you, like eating fruit and veg, and also there's no carbon emissions involved, and then wasting less stuff, as I said. And the main thing is spread the word. Tell everyone you know. Let's all save the planet. There's loads and loads to do with saving the planet in this book. As with all the cookie books, as well as a hilarious, funny laugh out loud story there's a bit in the back which is called the appendix and inside the appendix there's loads and loads of different activities and fun things that you can try out um at home so it's kind of like an interactive book almost there we go so um have a look at the stuff in the back of the book and if you want to try out an experiment or a recipe now in this book the gang join a forest club and they start um going camping and all sorts of strange stuff happens there is there a ghost is there not a ghost will they be able to save the planet what will happen that's book two cookie and the most annoying girl in the world which brings me now on to Logically, what comes after one and two? Book three. This one is called Cookie and the Most Mysterious Mystery in the World. Let's take a look at the cover. Now, there we are. Cookie and the Most Mysterious Mystery in the World. 
is all about a number of strange things that start occurring. As you can see, there's a computer on the front of the cover. And um, what happens is someone starts hacking into the school website. Who could it be? Cookie and the gang want to get to the bottom of it. On the Meet the Teachers homepage on the school website, all this gossip starts going up, saying strange things and strange private stories about the teachers. Cookie wants to know who it is that's putting up all this stuff. Who knows all this gossip about the teachers and how are they hacking into the school computer system? Not only is that a mystery that needs solving, but Jake's mum is acting very strange indeed. She's going to book club, but she's not taking a book with her. What could that mean? What's she actually doing? She's acting very secretive and very private. And meanwhile, Cookie's grandma has come over from Bangladesh and Cookie really, really wants to communicate with her and find out what her mum was like when she was young. But, but Cookie's granny can't speak any English at all. So Cookie needs to start using code and sign language and all sorts of inventive methods to communicate with her granny. And then the last mystery that occurs, someone starts getting really high scores on Cookie's favourite computer game. And it's not her. Who could it be? Lots and lots of mysteries to be solved in this book. Um, there's also an appendix in the back with loads of stuff that you can try out. Um, and like I said, the whole book is to do with problems and puzzles, problem solving, codes and mysteries. And actually, you can even learn to write your name in Bengali in the back, because Bengali, which is another language essentially, is a code. So you'll be able to write your name in a whole new language. There's lots to do with code breaking and problem solving and mysteries in the back of the book. So I thought it might be nice to read you a bit of the book and we can make this interactive as well. Um, so what we're gonna do is Cookie's a bit annoyed in this bit of the book because every time she asks her mum stuff, her mum just says nothing and Cookie's fed up of being fobbed off. So when I read you the story, if I say, all together now and do that. We should all say nothing. Uh, and that means that you can help me read the story. I'm going to read from chapter one. Oop, that's not it. There it is. Chapter one, which is called Secrets. Okay. And when I do that and say all together now, I want you all to say nothing. Okay. So here goes. Chapter one, Secrets. Why is it that parents always say nothing? when you ask them questions about their conversations with other grown-ups. What's a flexible mortgage? All together now. Nothing. It's like they think we're being nosy or that we're too young to understand things. What's the meaning of life? All together now. Nothing. But how can we learn anything? They don't tell us stuff in the first place. What does Mrs. Miggins gave our milkman a hickey mean? All together now? Nothing. In general, a good way to learn things is to ask questions, but nothing is not a helpful answer. I suppose there are a few exceptions. What is two minus two? Nothing. What is the opposite of everything? Nothing. What is Gnitten backwards? Nothing. What is the meaning of life? Nothing. Today, my mum got a letter from my nanny, her mum, and spent a good 20 minutes reading it and laughing out loud like it was the funniest joke book ever written. <laughs> when I asked her what it said, she just kept saying, Nothing. Nothing doesn't make people laugh, I said. To which she replied, really, it's nothing. Just nunny being nunny. Well, that is even more ridiculous. Of course, nunny is being nunny. Who else would she be? Father Christmas? Now that would be weird. Nunny, is that you? Ho, 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 Merry Christmas. I think saying nunny is just being nunny is a tautology. A tautology is when you repeat something that's already been said in the same sentence, like the scorching sun was boiling hot. 
Well, of course it was. Otherwise it wouldn't be scorching. I'm hot today. I hope so. You are the sun. Or calling a mystery mysterious. Mysterious mystery? Of course mysteries are mysterious. If the author of this book doesn't even know that, it must be rubbish. Duh. It's not rubbish. It's a very good book. Crammed full of mysteries, fun stuff, capers, mayhem, and lots and lots of jokes. All of the cookie books are packed full of jokes. I'll have you laughing out loud. And this one is no exception. So we're going to have a Q&A in about five minutes from now. But in the meantime, I thought it would be fun if we did some code breaking of our own. So I'm going to put a code up on the screen. There it is for you to have some a few minutes to have a look at and start decoding. If we can put that full screen, um, you can get going maybe on your pens and papers. There we go. And then the first class or person to put their message into the chat box and send it over. We'll read it out and give them a big shout out and a cheer. Um, so there we go, guys. Get decoding. See how you get on and uh, pop the message in the chat box as soon as you reckon you've got it. Hmm. Some of you are already busy decoding and scrambling away. Once you've got one letter, here's a good tip. Once you've got one letter, you can fill it in multiple times, potentially. So if you have a look, we can see Cookie's head is the first letter in our secret code. So if we look at the key, which is the bit at the top, Cookie's head represents the letter O. So we know that our coded message begins with the letter O, but if you're very clever, you could notice that further on in the code, Cookie's head repeats quite a few times. So you can pop the O in there as well without having to look it up. It's a really, really good decoding shortcut. So the first word begins with O and it's three letters long. I'm sure lots of you might have it already. O, then there's a heart and an apple. Oh, does anyone know what that is? So the heart is U and the apple is R. So the first word is O-U-R. There we go. I'm helping you too much now. I'll let you get on with it. Good luck, guys. And the first one to put the decoded message in the chat box will get a big shout out. And if we're out of time before any of you have decoded it, never mind. You can finish off in your own time later at home. So I'm going to give you a few more minutes to keep going with that and then we're going to do a Q&A. Good luck, good luck. Okay, you've got one and a half minutes left, everyone. One and a half minutes. Will someone get it? We shall see. If not, I will reveal it to you anyway. And you can keep on decoding when you get home. Or if you're already at home, you can keep on decoding right away. Okay, one more minute. One more minute. Hour is the first word. I can see that there's a double O somewhere in the middle because there's two of Cookie's head next to each other. The minute you think you know, pop it in the chat and send it over and we'll read it out and give you a big shout out and a wave. Not easy. Oh, I think we're 
nearly out of time. Ah, should we reveal the message or should we give you a little bit longer? Decisions, decisions. What does my glamorous assistant Olivia think? Let's see whether she puts the decoded message up or whether she gives us longer. Look, we're getting longer to decode. Because the decode, oh, there we go. Olivia has revealed the answer. Our event is full of cool kids who love to read. And that is very true. Uh, and I hope lots of you will keep reading and read the cookie books. They're really, really good fun. Um, but now I believe we've just about got time to have a Q&A session. So anybody with any questions, um, if you pop them in the chat box, then I think Olivia, my glamorous assistant, is going to appear on the screen alongside me. Here we go. Hello. There she is. Oh, no, I'm pointing the wrong way. There she is. I was just... Um... <laughs> I was just sweating away trying to work out the thing, and I think I just did it, but I just managed Thank to do you. it as I... Oh, I, well done! I know, I, I didn't give much time, because I, I was aware that at quarter two, we're going to have a Q&A session, so I jumped in there. But there are other codes to crack in the back of the cookie book for all you code-breaking, yeah, there's code-cracking lovers. Yeah, there's all sorts in the back here. It's fantastic. There's loads, loads of activities to do once you finish the book. You can just keep going. Absolutely. Um, we have had some questions. We've had some questions emailed in. So I'm uh -huh. going to get cracking with these ones. Great. Um, first one, what age would you recommend these books for? That is a good question. Um, so these books work on many different levels. And you can start reading them at about age seven, especially if you're a good reader um but they could be anything from age seven to age 12 and if you read them again and again then each time you can sort of understand more and learn more and maybe get a joke that you might not have got first time around so i would say really seven to 12 um you know so my eldest son is a much better reader than my younger son so you know for instance he could start these books earlier than my younger son so it just depends on the reader um but you know reading is what you get out of it there's so many funny jokes and pictures and all sorts in there it's always good to dip into a book and see what you think for yourself excellent and um i think i sort of uh, learned some new things as well especially when they're doing the play and they're talking about different characters Yes, different science. The science, the science play. Mm. Um, so they're good for 41 year olds too. <laughs> <laughs> You've told everyone your age now. <laughs> we'll gloss over that. Keep going, keep going. We won't we won't um, are the characters based on real people? Sometimes they're real people and sometimes they're a mix of people. So Cookie um, is loosely based on, you know, my upbringing when I was growing up. So Cookie has two sisters. Her middle sister is very into politics. Her older sister is off at university. So I have two sisters. My middle one is now my local MP. Um, my older one was always nine years old, so she was off at uni when I was Cookie's age as well. Um, she lives in the suburbs of London, as did I. Um, she's from a British Bangladeshi background, um, you know, born into a Muslim family. So there's lots of similarities between me and her. Then, you know, there's other characters like Jake, um, who's sort of loosely based on a good friend of mine. Kazaya is kind of loosely based on everyone's best friend. She's a great character. She's dependable. She's fun. She's a calming influence for Cookie. Cookie's very hot-headed and wild. She gets funny schemes into her head. Her mouth sometimes opens before her brain has engaged. Um, so, you know, there's loads and loads of characters that are based on sort of different people that I've encountered, including some of the teachers as well. Excellent. <laughs> I think people love it if they can recognise a teacher in there. <laughs> yeah, and the teachers are all so different. So there's Miss Chen, the science teacher. She's very, Mrs Chen is quite meek and mild. But then if you tip her over the edge, she can get really angry. Um, there's sort of the long-suffering class teacher, Mrs Manon, who's sort of always sort of putting up with their capers and their misdemeanours. Then there's um, the deputy head teacher, Mr Hastings 
who you catch him on a good day and he's lovely, catch him on a bad day and he's horrible. Um, then, you know, there's some, there's a supply teacher that comes in in book two, a temporary teacher who's very much like a sort of sergeant major or a matron character. She's the one that takes them off on forest club and it's almost like they're in the army or something, you know, on the zip wire and doing scramble nets and all sorts. Um, so yeah, there's loads of characters that are all very different and based on different people. Axel is kind of um, a quirky character in the friendship group. He sort of always looks at his floor and uh, the floor and doesn't make eye contact. And he can be kind of shy and quite a loner. But then at first they sort of judge him to be boring, but then they realize he's actually really good fun. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's loads of different characters all based on people throughout my yeah. life. Fantastic. And I think people will identify with those characters, which is what makes the book come to life? Yeah, hopefully so, definitely. There's so many different characters. Susie and Alice and Denby, you know, Susie Ashby is very, everything has to be perfect and immaculate. You know, she never has a hair out of place and, you know, she's very quick to judge other people. Um, you know, and we've all met one of those in our lives before. So, yeah, there's loads of different people that are crammed in there. Fantastic. Um Oh, I like this question, Connie. Have you ever solved a mystery? Oh, wow. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. And that is such a good question. You know, sometimes when I'm um, watching things or reading books, I like to try and solve the mysteries before I'm revealed the answer. And sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. But as for a real life mystery, sometimes when things go missing in our house, things often go missing. My kids put the remote control in funny places and all sorts of things and we have to retrace our steps. So sometimes I've solved mini mysteries, but never a really good one. Never solved a really, you know, a theft or a robbery, anything like that. Well, not yet. You never know. You never know. That's a great question. Thank you for that one. Um, now I've had this one sent in from Katie. Um, so it's quite a long question. I've got vivid memories of you visiting your family in Bangladesh when you're on Blue Peter. What's your favourite memory from your time as a Blue Peter presenter? That is such a difficult question because I had so many different experiences. You know, actually loads of the experiences are stuff I've drawn upon in the book. So, for instance, I did training with the Royal Marines um, and I had to go on their actual uh, induction course. I had to go on a zip wire. And Cookie has to go on a zip wire when she goes to um, Forest Club. And yeah. as you can see from this picture here at the bottom, she falls off the zip wire. And that's what actually happened to me when I was oh, doing no. one of my You can actually see it on YouTube when I fall <laughs> off the zip wire. It's very funny. I didn't think it was funny at the time. But all the thoughts going through her head were things that went through my head at that time. And in book one, Cookie goes on a quiz show on telly representing her school. I did that when I was young. Um, and uh, all the thoughts, once again, are things that went through her head. Um, but as for my most enjoyable memory, I think it has to be all the traveling. I went to so many countries and did so many different things and met so many wonderful people. Um, it would have to be the travel. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Could we get a shout out for Katie for that fantastic question? Hello, Katie. I hope you enjoyed watching me on Blue Peter all those years ago. Um, lovely to see you. And good work. Keep up the teaching. Teachers are heroes. You do such a brilliant job as we all learnt during homeschooling. You are stars. I take my hat off to you. I thank you. You made a day. <laughs> now, oh, um, we have a question, um, Connie, that we ask all our guests it's a bit of a strange question but i'm going to ask you if you were a biscuit what biscuit would you be oh that's a good question i bet no one's asked you that before either no i don't think they have you know what i might be i might be a jaffa cake because Ooh. yeah there's lots of different layers and you know there's fun orangey bit in the middle that's zingy but then there's chocolate which is sweet and lovable and like a hug and the spongy bit you know there's lots to it and it's soft as well and I like to think I'm soft and warm but a bit crazy as well a jaffa cake isn't it a bit crazy just having that weird sort of orange jelly in the middle so I guess yeah I'd probably be a jaffa cake because a crunchy biscuit I feel is not as sort of 
warm and loving as a Jaffa cake. <laughs> oh, yeah. Excellent. I, I like your I like your reasoning for that. I think that's the best reasoning we've had so far. <laughs> um, oh, we've just got a couple more questions. Did as a child, did you dream of, be, of writing or presenting? Was do one you know of those what? your favourite? You no, know I never thought I'd be able to do either. I just didn't think that's something that normal kids like me did. Which is a real lesson, everyone. Just follow your dreams and believe in yourself you can do whatever I was going to be an engineer I did all science A levels I did maths chemistry further maths physics um and actually I fell into presenting quite by chance but as with cookie I've always loved the arts I've always loved performing and I've always loved drama and sort of drawing and being creative but then I've always also loved science and maths and being practical and solving things and when I was growing up I used to get asked are you an arts person or a science person I used to think I'm both can't I be both and that's what cookie is so you'll see in the pictures you know her head thoughts and her mind is so creative but then also she's very scientific and very practical and one hero of mine is a lady called Ada Lovelace and she was the daughter of Lord Byron who was a very famous poet but her mother was a brilliant mathematician she worked with Charles Babbage who invented the computer he saw computers just as calculators where she saw that they had the capabilities to make music draw pictures and do so many weird and wonderful things and artistic and creative things as well and i often say a woman can bring something new to the equation but you know she is for me the epitome of someone that marries the arts and the sciences um so there you go yeah i actually was thinking that i'd be something totally different neither a writer nor a presenter but i love writing and i love presenting so i'm very lucky and i'm lucky that i can stick in a bit of science in the mix as well fantastic yeah it's i think that the more things you do in your life the more interesting it is mm, agree now can we expect any more connie books i'm oh, not connie you're connie any more cookie books from connie uh so the paperback is out in february of um of cookie book three uh which is exciting in fact i just had the cover layout sent to me hot off the press today because the cut the back cover is a bit different so i'm going to go and have a look at that uh and okay it after this call and then i was hoping or thinking about writing an environment book but a fun one but I'm not sure, because obviously book two is all, all about the environment, but then that's a um, fiction book. So maybe that will be next. Um, I've also uh, got a brilliant book, actually, which is a great Christmas book, which is called Fearless Fairy Tales, which is all your, um, all your classic fairy tales retold. So, for instance, that chap there is Trumpelstiltskin, who's money-obsessed and gold-obsessed and wants power, but he's also like Rumpelstiltskin. Over there, you can see Rapunzel, who loves rapping. She goes on Kingdom's Got Talent, and the head judge, Simon Scowl, tells her to cut her hair off. Um, there's Mouldy Socks and the Three Bears, and their Mouldy Socks has Mouldy Socks because he has no personal hygiene because he's addicted to playing on his iPad, basically. Um, there's Sleeping Brainy, who you can see in the bottom there, who wants to be a Chancellor of the Exchequer, but her dad wants her to be a princess. There's all sorts of characters um stuck in there and they're really funny stories of all your traditional classics but updated for the 21st century so that's fantastic fair. you're a busy lady connie <laughs> <laughs> now just before we say goodbye i know we've got some pictures um of the bird feeder were you going to set a challenge yes I get those pictures up. yes so guys Remember, we said that it's really important to be environmentally friendly and look after our planet. So I'm just going to quickly whiz you through um, how you can make your very own bird feeder. I want you to try this at home and um, then send pictures in. And all you need to do is you just need to get a milk carton or a juice carton, wash it out. Um, then you need to cut a window in the front and back. It's five centimetres by five centimetres and then your birds can fly in and out. You need to just decorate your carton. Uh, you can leave it blank on one side if you want. This one was all to do with the planet, so I left it blank. Or you can cover it with 
nice wrapping paper or you can paint on it like I've done there. Um, right, Bird Cafe, yum yum, get your seeds here. Here's one that I've painted all over and just put I love birds on the front. And then all you need to do is poke a stick through the bottom and that will be the perch. And you might need to get an adult to help you make the hole to poke the stick through. And your birds can perch and eat crumbs in uh, or bread crusts. And um, then to hang it up, it's really easy. Just get a bit of ribbon or thread, uh, stick it in the mouth of your carton, pop the lid on. And there we go. This is 100% recycled. Uh, it's, oop, I didn't pop my lid on, silly me. Um, but you don't need any glue, It'll just hold it in place. So 100% recycled, so it's very environmentally friendly. Um, it's also looking after plant and animal life. And you can watch the birds fly in and out of the bird feeder and feed from it in the garden and just have fun making. It's so simple and easy. And we'd love you to send in the bird feeders that you make. So please make sure you do get them into us. There we Fantastic. go. Fantastic. And some birds on there. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. That was the world's quickest bird feeder. So you can see it doesn't have to take a long time to make something fantastic. No, basically all it is is decorating a carton, cutting a window out, putting a perch in, and then just putting a loop through the mouth uh, and the lid to hang it up with. And that's it. That's your bird feeder. So it's mainly just decorating and cutting the window, popping the perch in. It's really easy. Get really your bird good. feeders to us. So you can send them in to us at lal at kirklees.gov.uk. That's our email address. We can put pictures of them on Connie's page of our website. You can yes. also put them on our social media for libraries, or you can you can tag in as well. You can tag Connie yeah, at Connie one. underscore yep. Huck. Oh, the dino one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've put dinosaur wrapping paper. I love birds. There we go. So you can get very creative with it and send them in to us. Brilliant. Definitely. So we really want to see them. You can also find out about Connie from her Twitter and from her publisher. So the publisher is normally on the side of the book there. So Piccadilly Press is your publisher, isn't it, Connie? Yes, that's right. Absolutely right. And I believe you've got a rather fantastic website, Connie-Huck.com. And you've got further activities on there, haven't you? And teacher resources and a chapter of one of your books. I believe so. Yeah. So, so there's all places you can go to find out more about Connie and to send your pictures in. So thank you, Connie. It's been fantastic to meet thank you. you so much. And we'll definitely get you back on when you write your next book. <laughs> Yay. Look forward to it. Brilliant. Thanks so much, guys. Right. We'll see you again. And um, we'll have to go off in a minute and get on with making our bird feeders. Yes, please do. And send in your pictures. That would be great. We will do. Thanks a lot, Connie. Thanks. See you later. See you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. See you. Oh, cut her off then. Sorry, Connie. Thank you. That was amazing. I've really enjoyed today's session. Now, we have next week, we've actually got our session on a Monday next week, just to confuse everybody. So we're going to be getting a little bit Christmassy. We're joined by Alexandra Page, and she's going to be here on Monday, the 6th of December at 11 o'clock with her book, Wish You Was. It's a lovely Christmassy book. And if you've got any questions for Alexandra, you can send them in in advance as normal to, oh, not to that one, to lal at kirklees.gov.uk. Or you can type in the questions on the day. And if you're wanting to watch any of the sessions again, remember, you can always go to our website, www.kirkleeslibraries.co.uk forward slash lal. And there'll be more information on there about Connie. You'll be able to watch any of our sessions again on there. Right, I'm going to disappear off now and hopefully we will see you on Monday. Bye, everyone. See you later. <laughs>